my mind wandered, actually, uh, in thinking about what we're going to talk about today, about the impact of the outcome of the general election on our collective supply chain operations. And listening to some of the commentary yesterday from, from the financial analysts in the city about the impact and the strength of the pound, should Mr. Corbyn become the Prime Minister, it was extraordinarily concerning uh, relative to you know, the weakness of the pound now and parity with the US dollar. And of course, if you're in a, an organization like John Lewis, where uh, our hedge funding, our hedged dollars, as it's essentially expired at this stage from last year, post-Brexit, uh, we find ourselves in a position where our supply chain costs are ever-growing, and that prospect is, is really significantly frightening. Not the subject of today, but interesting to think about um, in the context of where we all find ourselves, nevertheless. May I ask, is anybody, would you show a hand, a John Lewis shopper, who would consider themselves a customer of John Lewis? And at the same time, would you consider yourself a customer of Waitrose? Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, we have, uh, and you are amongst 5% of those people who shop with us who account for 46 or 7% of our total sales. So we have an incredibly strong and loyal customer base who we are deeply focused on. And if you put that into the context of last year, we delivered through the supply chain as opposed to our branches, 51% of our sales. So our delivery of sales has now outweighed that which we sell through John Lewis branches, not in Waitrose the same. So uh, getting the supply chain right, it's the dim, distant days of the dusty warehouse in men in brown coats it has gone by. So what I'm going to hopefully present to you is a story of a modern retailer with a modern supply chain responding to the requirements of the customers of today, which are you. And how we do that will define the success of our business today, tomorrow, and in the future. And the role that we all play, the operational part of the business, that hitherto or in the years gone by was sort of an adjunct that could get replenishment there within five days, and that was going to be okay, is defining the success of the increasing demands of our customer base. So this is incredibly important stuff for our business, for our collective profession, and where we are. So without further ado because I can really ramble on when I get going. I should take you out of your misery, and we'll move ahead. So John Lewis has a rich history dating back to uh, 1864, when John Lewis himself set up the business, decided he was going to become a retailer on Oxford Street, and started investing in his business. He passed it to his son, John Speed and Lewis, and in 1924, in a potted history, John Speed in 1928, John Speed and Lewis, who earned that year as much money with his two sons as the rest of his staff said, this is unacceptable. I shall give this business to the staff of this business and pass it in, in trust over to the partners of the business. So we are all co-owners of this business now. And this business, um, starting with John Lewis, uh, 46 department stores across the United Kingdom, many of which you'll be familiar with within John Lewis itself as opposed to Waits Road, just under 40,000 partners, co-owners, uh, amounting to about 85,000. We have been up to nudging to 100,000. And I always felt that I was a soldier for many years, the day that the John Lewis partnership became bigger than the British Army. I'm never sure if that was a good thing or a bad thing, but that is where it is uh, today. And every single one of those owners takes a slice of the success of our business and is driven by what we call Principle One, which states in the Constitution written by John Speed and Lewis, who is somewhat a... Uh, sort of oligarch within, um, you know, the, the omnipresent constitution that says in principle one, this business is established for the happiness of its partners in worthwhile and successful, uh, wor a worthwhile and satisfying employment in a successful business. So that is what drives the culture and the values uh, of John Lewis. So each year, at the end of the year, we divide the profits amongst ourselves on an equal basis based on your salary. For example, you may get 17% as a bonus, which is a reflective on your own. So we split up the profits, and that's how it's deemed to be fair. Uh, this year, we had the worst profit, uh, the worst bonus since 1952. We got 6% um, across the piece. So uh, there are pressures on our business, and some of which will come out, I hope, during this conversation. Um, international locations, we could come back and discuss that in due course. We've got international presence we've never had before, Middle East, Far East, beginning to push out with some franchising waitresses as well. Uh, just under 5 billion uh, 
in terms of sales. Most of that comes in the fourth quarter of the year. We're basically becoming a Christmas shop. I'd be very interested in everyone's opinion whether they thought the Buster advert with the fox on the trampoline, if you like my father-in-law, he said, it must have taken years to train that fox. <laughs> I'm never quite sure <laughs> he didn't get the joke. Whether that uh, was, a, was a sort of better advert than the year before. Do you remember the man on the moon? Um, which I personally felt was the idea of a man with a mullet peering down from the moon looking into a teenager's bedroom was marginally uncomfortable. But uh, <laughs> we, we moved away from that, luckily, to something more humorous uh, last year. Um, so, big effort at the end of the year. Uh, SKUs, we have a, a shocking number of SKUs. We have today 82 different types of kettles. Uh, that doesn't even describe the colour of the kettle within that. So we have, uh, you know, a, um, a curated assortment, as the buyers like to call it. And I question whether that's a curated assortment. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a, it's a tiny amount relative to Amazon, for example. And these are the marketplaces that we're in at the moment. So we have a growing number of SKUs, a growing uh, unlimited uh, variety of product based on, uh, obviously, f fulfillment from, from our website, more of which in due course. Uh, Waitrose branch is there um, and uh, have grown exponentially over the last five or six years and uh, took just over six and a half billion pounds last year for the partnership. And we grew uh, both in sales, net promoter score last year, and also important people like you crossing both channels, shopping in Waitrose and John Lewis. So uh, we're in a good spot on one level, but recognising, as our chairman describes it, societal pressures, very significant pressures based on human behaviour, well, digital behaviour ultimately, and putting pressure on uh, the business. Um, so that's where we find ourselves. A time of change in the retail world that we've had to respond to very significantly. It was all originally when uh, Mr. Speed and Lewis was about... He was all about uh, personal uh, personalization and the intimacy of the relationship and one-on-one -on -one basis. And if you went into Peter Jones, which he purchased uh, in the 1920s and his son ran, it was all about the relationship, individual relationships and extraordinary customer service. And perhaps John Lewis's reputation was built at that time. And it's a culture that's embedded henceforth uh, and really, really strong. And our challenge is to maintain that in a world where over 50% of your product is delivered. And how does that personal relationship of any organization extend? How can we get the supply chain into someone's home that they feel they've got a relationship with an organization? From personal to mass, uh, and it was the large department store, the checkout, you can see uh, the image there. And then some of the description where I am now, the idea that we have mass personalization, a scale of you know, an extraordinary sale where we have a quiet day, uh, it would be a disappointing day where if we ship 30,000 click and collect parcels, uh, units, that is, in, in, in a day, so, for example. So last week, typically, uh, we shipped 257,000 uh, units thereabouts, which is under the number that was a quiet week that we shipped in one day on Black Friday last year. So uh, it's a big push and somehow we need to take that relationship and all we do, mass personalization, so we can't just be, here's another delivery from John Lewis, but this is done uh, with the customer at the heart of everything we do. So that's where we are, and that's a challenge we're facing. Historically, uh, you all appreciate that with the depth of history comes some reticence to move on. We have... I think the lowest staff turnover of any organization you can possibly imagine in the United Kingdom after five years. I think there's about 1% turnover. People stay forever. Had a final salary pension scheme uh, that was slightly changed last year, but we, that comes with its own challenges. And when the current chairman in 19, well, in 2001, uh, one said to the board, I've got this, he was the business, head of business development, and I've got this idea, I think we should buy a website. And they said, good Lord, no, it's never going to catch on. Get out. Um, and eventually, he went to visit all the board members over one weekend in their homes and said, 
this is the future. You know, we've got to get into this digital space. You can see how it's happening, da, da, da. And he managed to persuade them. And they were very reluctant. They said, we can conceivably see some people buying things online, but why on earth would you do that? You need to touch and feel it and interact with the staff in the store. And reluctantly, they allowed him to put it on one side of the business as an experiment. Uh, and so from there, uh, we've progressed forward to some extent, and we have... Uh, a truly omni-channel business in the sense of we have several different channels uh, selling products to customers and we've adapted our formats. We have uh, different formats, branches. Uh, we have um, one at Heathrow Terminal 2 now, which is incredibly successful, which uh, week on week is probably the best performing branch uh, in surprisingly within John Lewis in terms of sales growth, but unfortunately it's tiny and we... Uh, we also have one in Birmingham that we spent a fortune on that doesn't have quite the momentum, we'll put it like that, that we would aspire to with a full-line department store at a huge city. So there are some challenges in terms of our store footprint, but nevertheless, the point is we have adapted our department stores to different sizes and shapes, and we will be unlikely ever to open a full-line department store. We're much more likely to open the at-homes, which is a smaller version more of which later. That's a business-to-business -business operation that we run. We have that's Ipswich, where John Lewis and Waitrose now together, operating in one location, and then John Lewis in Dubai. So we're beginning to change our format, and of course we have our website, where I think today we're price matching one of our competitors. I've never known any undersold, so please feel free to go on and grab an exceptional deal. So good has our uh, so good has our transition or transformation into a omnichannel retailer B that we have grown sales year on year uh, to last year where we were 42% uh, online of all our sales. So uh, the website contributed <coughs> about £2 billion to the, to the business as a whole and is likely to grow. And we are seeing the future 50-50 in the not too distant future. And originally, three years ago, we were saying, well, by 2021, 22, we could see nudging towards 40. Uh, we're there already, and the challenge has been to catch up and make sure we're ahead of the game. So we had a supply chain we've invested in hugely to deal with that future, and that future has come here and now, and that's what we're dealing with. And we spent a lot of money on investing in our supply chain, consolidating the supply chain, being super efficient, and we've got to keep doing it. So there's a real challenge in terms of the pace of online growth. Uh, last week, um, we grew our sales 8% week on week, year on year, for last week, online, department store sales uh, reduced by 3.5% last week, which has been about the norm. So that was against last year's increase online was 13.5% last week. So it's slightly slower growth online, but nevertheless, the trend is absolutely there and likely to continue for the foreseeable future. So some great questions in terms of not only challenges within the supply chain, but the role of the branch in the future. And we've got a big physical estate. We've got a lot of people employed there and how, how that works in the future. We've also got, all of us, the demanding customers who want everything everywhere all the time, faster and probably uh, a bit cheaper as well. So we have to respond to those challenges. And whether you think that speed is the defining factor, there is a, we could have a discussion about, a collective race at the bottom. Is it better to deliver quicker? Do people really need the product within a few hours? Is the demand truly there, or do you just have to be out there? We would like to do something like a, a prime service in certain areas of the country. We could get product within an hour, but sometimes that drives in you know, extra operational costs. Cost, what's the actual demand? We've tested some of the demand, and one way or another, it's probably not in itself a business case, but there is quite a bit of momentum in terms of pure speed alone just getting products. And it drives you to second stock holdings. You know, Amazon have 13 distribution centers, I think it is now within the United Kingdom. Lots of different stock holdings of similar stock that they can offer as well. So it drives cost, uh, and all this comes with uh, great uh, expense and real challenge. So we have experimented thing with things like deliver to your boot of your car, and we're working with organizations looking at what the options are to absolutely maximize convenience, whether people need it or want it. I don't know. Maybe it's in the Steve Jobs category. You don't know what you want until I'm going to tell you what you want, and then we're going to uh, discover that's where. So there's a race for speed, convenience, and comes with that, uh, the returns. If I tell you last week, and it won't surprise you because it's followed a trend that's existed in Europe for some time, 50% of our women's wear SORs 
sales online were returned. So that product returned at that cost. In terms of stock holding, how quickly can we get that back into our supply chain and sold out uh, across the business again? So these are real pressing issues that uh, we are facing into here and now. I'm sure many of you um, have a similar experience. Our returns rate is about 8% unit terms overall, but it's, um, it's where it's at, these sorts of challenges. Omni-channel returns, so you can return in Waitrose, you can return through Collect Plus, you can return in John Lewis, you can post it to us. We have an omni-returns process, all of which is somehow we need to give you reassurance. So we've just introduced within Waitrose, you go in, you get your return scanned, and you get a text message saying thank you for your return. We'll notify you when it reaches our return centre. When it reaches the return centre, you get another text saying thank you, it's reached our return centre. We'll process it immediately. And when we've processed it, you'll get your refund, and you get your refund, and it says your refund has now been uh, processed and will be in your bank shortly. The reason we've done that, uh, apart from wishing to delight the customer, obviously, and reassure them, a third of our calls into our contact centres at £2.70 a call were for people saying, where's my refund? So the speed you can do that, the reassurance you can offer your customer, this is about the supply chain operating in terms of the customer mindset and all it can do. So returns is really, really challenging. It has been challenging for some time. I'm not saying we've necessarily got a home run there, but we're beginning to understand what we need to do. And, of course, we have a stock holding that needs to reflect some of this, and we have, you know, uh, we can talk about how many weeks cover you need to have, but uh, I've said with these sheds we have bursting at the seams, uh, we've got too much stock. We can't afford to have the levels of stock we previously had. You know, sometimes we nudge toward a billion pounds worth of stock, um, and, and we need to refine that somehow. So real challenges. And I wanted to illustrate this by one great graph. It looks a bit confusing to start. This is about customer convenience and speed. So back here, uh, we are on 2010, and today the big sort of light blue segment is that's total demand for for, for um, online orders every day. The, the darker blue on the bottom there is home delivery. <coughs> the light slug and the orange one is click and collect. So as soon as we introduced it, what we found is everybody's opted for next day, click and collect. So the pressure on the supply chain has changed. That was a five-day delivery window, the bottom one, and that is get it the next day. And by the way, you can order tonight at 7.59... And we'll have it in Waitrose for you uh, by, well, 2 p.m. we'll say, but it will be there earlier tomorrow. So that is how the supply chain has changed in the sense that that graph perfectly illustrates how the world has changed and the expectation of the customer. We want it tomorrow. Uh, we want it in a convenient location. and We want it quickly, you know. Uh, customer interactions come in lots and lots of different ways. And when people talk in terms of omni-channel, uh, they often think about how you buy, but look at the different ways that uh, we interact with our customers. We spend a lot of time trying to understand and turn over the customer uh, behavior and our very best customers. We've gone deep into customer analytics this year, and we can start not using your individual data, because obviously you're not allowed to do that, but we're allowed to segment people's behavior. And I can tell you, if you're buying Lego on a Saturday morning... In a John Lewis branch, you have a 44% chance of being one of our very best customers. So if you get bothered by a John Lewis partner approaching you, if you're in the Lego department on a Saturday morning, that's because they think you're one of our very best customers. So you'll get special treatment. Or the wine aisle in Waitrose on a Thursday afternoon, apparently that is the place to be for a best customer, which is, I don't know why. Um, or a lady, this is what I love, in the haberdashery department before midday on a Monday morning typically is one of our very, very best customers. No idea why, but they've done all the analytics, so we're super focused on focusing on our best customers because of the uh, maths I mentioned at the beginning. So the point is we transact in different ways. We have multiple means of transacting with our customers, and we must value our very, very best customers, having identified them. The behaviours of uh, all our behaviours are changing hugely, and here is a map of a, of a day, uh, a graph of a day, uh, by time, midnight to midnight, and that's how our shopping behaviour uh, feels. This is normally, actually, this is total sales, but what is so interesting about fashion, if you look at fashion, this is dual screening, watching the telly with your iPad at about half past 
eight, nine o'clock where you've had a glass of wine and then you're buying stuff that the next day you regret and you send back to us. So if you could stop doing that, that would be helpful. <laughs> but this is what all the different uh, dissections tell us of, of customer behaviour. So it's coming later in the day. People are shopping uh, in a very different way and often um, we have to fulfil that uh, the very next day as well. So it's happening at the end of the day and faster. So we're all uh, beginning to shop like that on tablets as a po and mobile as opposed to obviously self-evidently <laughs> desktop. And what's intriguing is um, there used to be a spike at lunchtime as well on desktops. It was obviously work, but that seems to have died away in the last few years with people just shopping all day. Um, this is, this is as, as well as the day, as well as the expectation of the next day, that is the year, and it doesn't come out, it's come out extremely badly, 12-month period from January through to January. Um, and this is, this is John Lewis, uh, Black Friday, 900 times bigger, or 900% bigger than our quietest day, uh, and that needs to be fulfilled next day. Last year, we had uh, half a million unit demand uh, put on us to, to get out the door for, for next day. Uh, and this is the way of the world and where we are. We were offering bargains, and that is, is, is the Christmas period. More of that later. That's the summer clearance which we were just going into. So we have to have a supply chain optimised. Look at the investment you need to do that, but for one, one day uh, and the rest of the year. So we spend a lot of time thinking about the counter-cyclical activity, and if anybody wants to come and talk to us about how we fill the capacity here... It is one of the great nuts to crack, isn't it? If we had somebody who has a... You've got these amazing warehouses, you've invested a fortune in them, and how do we get alongside you? You know, we've thought about different organisations who don't have a Black Friday, don't have a Christmas pre, uh, and um, we could help along, <laughs> along the lines there. So Chris, uh, clearance is coming up, and the summer clearance period. We've got some amazing offers this summer clearance, and uh, it starts next week. Um, I wanted to show you the... Uh, in more detail, the slides have come out really badly uh, today, but this is the Christmas period. Three peaks, essentially, the pre, well, the Black Friday period, which has now become our biggest weekend, the Black Five Day weekend, which we start planning for this coming week, uh, where we do various different things to manage that demand and fulfil that demand. I'm sure everybody has their own challenges in well, they have peak periods. Going into the Christmas week, which although now we can manage within capacity and the fullness of time, of course, what we're able to do in some instances around Black Friday is potentially fulfil later. For example, our partners, who represented 20% of next day demand when they shop because they got discount on Black Friday, they got discount, Black Friday discount and then partner discount, we actually stopped them shopping because, not because of that, but because of the amount of demand. So we took some of the spike off the top of the spike to allow us to do that. But, of course, in the week before Christmas, we can't do that because they can't come and shop because everyone's looking for Christmas presents. So the week before Christmas is, is the big uh, challenge on the horizon. Uh, and last year, what was so interesting is we managed our Christmas post-Christmas service level agreement for Click and Collect from 24 hours. We pushed it out to 48 hours and told customers what they picked. They will be ready in two days. And we had not a whisper from a single customer, nobody says, well, I expect it next day. So then you start thinking about whether actually there is something in next day delivery or actually just clarity and certainty. I want to pick it up then to know it's there then. So that is the conversation to say, how brave are you really? Uh, it's just about certainty, not being messed around. So that's challenged us all. Um, I think I've mentioned 80% of sales from John Lewis in the last quarter of the year and the clearance period. So we're basically all kicking our heels, speaking at conferences uh, for the rest of the year, and then um, getting ready for, for, for Christmas time. In order for us to crack this, we have uh, spent uh, a lot of money in uh, our supply chain, in our wonderfully <laughs> modern and relevant supply chain, and we have, as you see, automated it, uh, and we have all sorts of incredibly impressive things there. There is a new dynamic buffer system where we have hanging 1.6 million hanging garments uh, in, the, in the sortation system where if you order, it'll be auto-selected from there, auto-packed and dispatched to you. And we've begun to consolidate it. So that's 1.6 million hanging garments 24-7, 
except for Christmas Day, is the only day we're not working. And there are 40 people who work there. Uh, so we've got a really modern supply chain um, with all the automation that comes with all the debates about societal change and how automation uh, and automated jobs has changed the society and on our workforce. So lots of interesting issues there. And um, we have consolidated. We had warehouses in Cumbria. We had several around Milton Keynes that we brought into fewer larger distribution centres. And we've invested a lot of money in these distribution centres. And we finally, in the end of March, got to the end of a transformation programme that's taken us uh, 18 months or so. We've, we've got the last rollout of a WMS going in now, which will really conclude it. But we've run out of space already um, for fulfilment, throughput capacity. We need more packed benches. We need you know, continual investment. So the pace of migration online drives this investment. So the question is about, you know, how do you... It, it, it's it's self-evidently more expensive. It costs, you know, you've got the carrier costs, you've got the packaging costs to fulfill a pair of socks to waitress than it is for someone to come into your branch and pick them themselves and pack them themselves and take them home. So we go online, we're, uh, you, you know, a, 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 and that challenges our profitability, and we continue to do that. So one of the reasons why we had to, you know, reflect where we are in the bonus, for example, is about the challenge of, of omnichannel retail here and now and the expectation of everybody uh, within that. So uh, I've rattled on enough. Uh, I will just go on a little bit more about what lies ahead potentially. Continued growth online, we've mentioned that. No question about it, that's the world we live in. And uh, I'm sure we all relate to that hugely, the challenges that come with that. Uh, we were going to continue to um, roll out some more branches. We're going to open uh, Oxford later this year and, and Cheltenham. Uh, and that's all set on course. And Westfield next year. Uh, to continue with a bricks and click strategy that um, there was a very sound argument to say we could have changed. Uh, the first time I listened to somebody present the other day was about five years' time, the relevance of the high street and how people are going to come back onto the high street. So we're thinking that we're going to hold our nerves. We have a continual conversation about uh, the role of the branch for the future and they're looking at about innovation in our branches to attract customers in. It's a different experience, whether it's the brand embassy or, or we're simply offering different services and we're be we were beginning to trial uh, different services in Milton Keynes, John Lewis, for example, whether it's gardening, painting and decorating, all sorts of different services to offer the customer a broader experience to say, you're doing it at your house, we can help you in all sorts of ways. And what we want to do is get this through life connection with with you as our best customers so that you can come to us whether it's special events through your lifetime through your families everything so it's about a role of an organization the branch plays an important role in that so we're thinking creatively about the role of the branch in the future and we are convinced that in due course as uh, we'll come back to human and digital there's something that goes beyond just digitization there's something that goes beyond simply being online on your own, there's an interaction with human beings that ultimately uh, we're all in, we all enjoy and we'll find better than just simply the binary relationship with a tablet. Um, anyway, so we're, we're convinced by uh, the continued effort in terms of the branches. And um, I was at a conference the other day listening. It was about the Internet of Things, and I was talking about the Internet of Things, about supply chain visibility, actually, and big data, and how we can see the importance of that for uh, stock visibility and certainty around customer orders. But what was more interesting, uh, way more interesting than me, was uh, Hive and their association and collaboration with Amazon and Alexa. And they are going to offer Alexa at half price when you buy Hive products. So the artificial intelligence and the home channel is opening up. So they say online, mobile, branch, home. I can talk to Alexa. I've got Alexa at home. Say, Alexa, I'd like to buy a space hopper for the garden. It's in your shopping basket. And before you go ahead, Alexa. Before I know it, it's ordered through Amazon and it's coming through my door. There's a new channel that's opening up uh, <laughs> and it's artificial intelligence. It's home. It's connected, the connected world we live in. So my concluding thought, and all I wanted to really get across, is omni-channel retailing is, I think, a notion that should be pushed to one side, as yesterday's news, and something called asymmetric retail, where 
it can be anything, anywhere, on any channel at any time. And descriptions like channel, ultimately, are that which you look through your own eyes as a retailer. How do I organize my branches? Is the online team sorted out? Da, 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 da. But for a customer, it doesn't matter, does it? You would buy online. You might buy through your home device. You'd return it somewhere. You know, this is about convenience. So move away from a description of channels into something that's asymmetric. It's about, it's all around us. You can do anything at any time. And if your organization potentially is set up to deal with that, I think it drives for supply chain professionals a different mindset. It's about agility. It's about our ability to respond and do well in uncertainty and some ambiguity and move fast. And it drives a different type of person, I think, and a different type of leadership in the supply chain and retail supply chain anyway. So that's enough from me. Thank you for your time uh, and listening. I don't know if anybody wants to discuss any of those points or has uh, anything uh, they would wish to add.